This one's gonna go by pretty quick since I wrote it all out in advance. I'm going to be running a game in 20 minutes and then I'll be gone for a few hours. I'll try to punch it all out in time, but in the meantime feel free to leave comments, I'll respond to them after the break. I really put a lot of love into this installment, and I hope it shows. Pick is a gorilla's pastiche because the lyrics of Demon Days are surprisingly cyberpunk, and relevant later in the story. In these Demon Days it's so cold inside. So hard for a good soul to survive. You can't even trust the air you breathe. Cause Mother Earth wants us all to leave. So without further ado, let's begin. No pictures because I need to be quick, also because I have some draw faggotry for later in the story and don't want to get it lost in an imaginump. Goro the ghoul gestured out at the water. A black oil rig stood awkwardly out in the coastal waters, leaning about 15 degrees more to the south than would probably pass any inspection. A mass of scrap metal, low-tech boats, and bulbous flotation devices surrounded the barnacle-covered base like a moat, an amphibious shanty town. Speedboats kept a tight perimeter, the black men and then carrying the distinctive silhouettes of RPGs. One such speedboat approached the team zone. Goro cut his engines, held up his arms, and made clear that he was unarmed nominally there was an assault rifle beneath his seat, but the fanti pirates didn't need to know that. Dervish kept his gun at his side, accessible but lowered. The boat pulled up alongside the team zone. In it were four men. Three of them wore shemigs and rags, and were carrying small arms. The fourth, the obvious leader, was every horizon stereotype of the scary black man known to man. He wore a military uniform of indistinguishable make, with the arms torn off, revealing massive bronze biceps. His face was unshorn and covered in curly black hair. He wore huge aviator sunglasses, and surveyed the team with a slight, dismissive snarl. White men. Explain yourselves. Geppetto adjusted his tire, stood up, and announced impartially. We wish to do business with the Jackal King. The lieutenant growled. And on whose behalf do you speak? We are Americans, but we come recommended from Raz and General Sadami. And what is it that you have to offer? Money. Money and guns. The lieutenant seemed to consider this, and nodded slowly. All who wish to speak with the exalted Jackal King will come on this boat, with us. The dead man will take his boat no further. Goro nodded. Geppetto gestured to Bend and Dervish. Feel come as my security. 2D, stay in the boat. Keep your rotted drones and dragonflies aloft, and dismantle anyone who tries to double cross us. We'll take another boat back and switch you out with Bend when we need you to verify Julien's code. I hear ya. Diving now. 2D lay back in the speedboat, reaching into his backpack for sunblock and his water canteen. His I am not racist, I hate everyone equally t-shirt was already soaked in nerd sweat. The lieutenant gestured for the team to cross into his boat. Although it bowed dangerously when Dervish stepped in, the boat held true. Dervish, Geppetto, and Bend were treated to a montage of human suffering as they were led through the Fantis floating kingdom. Dozens of African civilians, perhaps volunteers, perhaps kidnapped labor, perhaps a mix of the two. Lay and sat in various states of starvation induced languor across mountains of sharp, hot scrap metal. Gunshots resounded as the team approached the stairs up into the rig proper, and intensified until they reached one of the exterior catwalks. A loud, angry man was drilling a dozen small children to use their sidearms properly as they shot at rough scrap facsimiles of Nigerian provisional government soldiers. One scrap mannequin actually wore a torn uniform, stained with old blood. The drill instructor repeated the mantra. The government will show no mercy. Neither will you. Kill him, kill him before he kills you. Geppetto stifled an absurdist smile. The smell of gun smoke, sweat, and cocaine rang triumphantly through his nostrils. For all of the good looks and kindness that the Evo commercials would have you believe constituted the world, this was the real face of humanity. Ignorant, cruel, poor, disease-ridden, with nothing left to it but violence. Ben just looked deeply, deeply uncomfortable as they neared the top of the defunct oil rig, nearing the foreman's office, the court of the Jackal King. Compared to his minions, the Jackal King lived in utter excess. His corroded metal walls were done up with garish purple wallpaper. Gold plating covered utterly superfluous objects such as a comlink and a set of ceramic body armor. A fancy heart-shaped bed with curtains had been imported, like some kind of tacky harlequin romance fixture. Lab Nanakwisi, the Jackal King, 
sat on his plastic golden throne, having evidently just received very vigorous oral sex from one of the many women surrounding him. If his demeanor was anything to go by, he wore a leopard print pimp suit, ugly diamond studded bling, and AR shades of the Kanye variety. He looked healthy or even a little bit broad, with none of the malnourishment of his soldiers. Standing in the back of the room was a harsh looking German man in a Peace Corps uniform, looking drained. The medical set at his side was barely depleted, having evidently been claimed by the king, rather than distributed to his dying people. Americans. Queasy laughed loudly from his chair, exuding the sort of childish glee that only a war criminal can when presented with new toys. And what do you bring me today? Geppetto stood in front of the Jack Hall King. Guns and money. Whatever you desire, sir, we only ask that the Peace Corps doctor return with us. Julian turned his head toward Geppetto, attention peaked. Queasy scoffed. The doctor is invaluable. He treats me when I become sick, and has many drugs, and the ability to make more. I will need many rifles for him. And much money. Please, King, be reasonable. If you can fathom letting him go, then let us know your price. Queasy growled and tapped himself on the knee. He held an arm out to the side and a bodyguard handed him a diamond tipped cane, which he began to fiddle with. Eventually he reached his decision. AKs. At least 5. And 1000 of your American dollars. And your tie. Give me your tie. Geppetto stared. This is a Sicilian tie. No tie. No deal. Dervish and Ben both looked expectantly at Geppetto, and he glared back at them out of spite. Eventually, with a huff, he began to undo his tie. I bought this tie specifically to go with this suit. Also, we'll have your AKs and money to you as soon as we retrieve our hacker. We need to ask Dr. Julian for something before he rescue him. Julian chuckled and spoke up. Something told me you weren't doing this out of the goodness of your heart. Of course not, said Geppetto, with a cruel smile, as he tossed his tie to Queasy, we're Americans. Julian stepped forward. And what is it that you need before I can go back to helping people who truly need me? The third satellite code to locate two times bunker. Julian raised his eyebrows, mildly surprised. Aha. So you were the reason that the German running team shipped in. I imagine there's not much left of them, is there? Burned to a crisp to a man. Well, I don't intend to join them, Julian reached into his pocket and produced a small data stick. Hand this to your hacker. 15 minutes later, 2D stumbled into the room, breathing heavily with 5 AK-47s tied to his back. Oh my god yes, there are so many stairs on these things so many stairs. And these guns are so heavy. Hold up, I gotta catch my breath. We have the third satellite code, 2D. 2D recovered in half a breath, immediately dropped the AKs on the floor, and lunged for the Datastic. Oh yeah fucking score. 2D jacked the Datastic in and began thrusting wildly as his brain coordinated three satellite data streams simultaneously, each bearing a complex encryption code applying to the other two. He slammed through barriers in data space bodily, feeling the pressure on his lungs. It was like fucking an earthquake. It was like flying up a waterfall dick first. It was like being God, if God was on Viagra. Oh shit yeah and... With a thud, 2D soiled his shorts for the third and final time and slammed to the floor with a clang. Julien, the Jackal King, and the African soldiers all instinctively stepped back. Dervish I think that one may have just killed him. Bent couldn't we have, like, went back to the boat first. I found him, screamed 2D, maniacally, as he scrambled onto his elbows and knees. I found the fucker. After a sobering moment of silence, he continued, but you're not going to like where the bunker is. Geppetto almost resisted the masochistic urge to ask, but asked anyway. And that is? Bogota. Bogota, Aslan. Julian stroked his chin. Huh. I always figured on Greenland or something. Dervish brought up the minor, but pressing issue. Um. Bogota is an active war zone. 2D gulped. Yep, I know, the team stood awkwardly at the shipping terminal of Nyamkapan International Airport, waiting for the private transport Raz was sending to airdrop them into Bogota. Shipping workers, ghouls and other infected to a man although most of them wore hazard suits. 
to avoid scaring off their international and uninfected visitors drove past the Shadrinas in forklifts, carrying refrigerated coffins ambiguously labeled meat 2D attempted to leave. Devish grabbed him by the collar and dragged him back. This was approximately the third time. Geppetto, who had been resting his eyes and his abused, sunburned vampire skin, tipped his hat up to look at his hacker. 2D, stop trying to run away. You can't make me. I absolutely can. As can Dervish. Well be dropped a few miles away from the bunker, 2D. We probably won't even run afoul of as technology. I hear that if the Jaguar warriors capture you, they rape you to death. With Jaguar penises. Bend, sitting on a meat container and sharpening his knife, coughed involuntarily. Geppetto I 2D in disbelief. Where the fuck did you hear that? 4chan. I figured as much. Look, I think our plane is coming in now. As the tilt rotor transport decelerated overhead and began to settle down, Dervish went on a hunch, and called up Sensei. Dervish. Glad I caught you, son. Don't come home. A bunch of feral goblins burrowed up through the basement. Luckily the sludge spirit on the second floor has started trying to drown them, but the building's gonna smell like shit for weeks. I grabbed my horse and cart, I am clearing out for a few days. You have a horse and cart? Well, something resembling a horse and cart, anyway. What can I do you for? Sensei, I am going to Bogota. Kill some Azis for me, boy. Make me proud. Well, about that. I am not signing up militarily. I am going there on a Shadoran. Oh. And what do you need? I need to get into contact with someone who can get us across the city. We're going to be airdropped at the south end. But the place we need to get to is in the north. Azzy territory. Our pilot won't go over the Azzy ground. He'll get shot down since he runs with Raz. You got anyone? A resistance cell, maybe? I know you fought down there. Sensei growled into his comlink. Oh, yeah. I got someone. Don't trust her for a moment, though. She's a heartless bitch of the worst variety. I regret ever associating with her. Just pay her, stick close, get across the city, and don't make any lasting deals with her. She'll make you rue that decision for the rest of your life. Dervish asked, timidly or at least as timidly as a giant street Sam can ask a question. So you don't have anyone who won't fuck us in the ass? I am afraid not, son. You find some resistance fighters, and you ask for Mariela Rodriguez. Tell her that El Cabralo vouches for you. This is awfully mysterious, sensei. SOS life. Tell Mariella to rot in hell for me, the team dropped in Amazonian resistance territory at around 400 hours. Dervish slammed down first, Iron Man style, followed by 2D flanked by his drones, then Geppetto, and finally Bend, who had served as an actual paratrooper once upon a time. 2D and Geppetto both made asses of themselves on landing, but at least 2D remembered to pack his boots. Geppetto landed hard on his knees in a puddle of mud, ruining his slacks and loafers. Well, that was quick. Dervish grabbed him by the shoulders, lifted him, and made for a collapsed office building nearby. No time to whine about your suit. We're in an active war zone now. That means you and 2D delegate to Bend. He's fought the Aziz before. Bend decloaked in the cover of the building. Yeah, and fear dirty bastards. I am torn between the pain of having to fight these guys again and the happiness that I might get a chance to put another Azzy down. 2D blinked at Bend. That's, um, that's a bit of a change of demeanor, Bend. Back in the day, they captured the woman I loved because I fucked up a sabotage run, left a trail. You don't want to know what they do to their prisoners. I say kill them all. There was an awkward pause as Bend peered out a window on the opposite side of the building, then gestured for the team to advance. Gunfire rattled in the distance. Intel says that this is one of the traveled resistance routes, but since that relies on sat footage, the Azis probably already know. Which in turn leads me to believe that the route's fake, and it's probably crawling with Azis. Hold on, I have a hunch. The team followed Bend as he stalked over to the basement door, half buried under rubble. I thought so. Freshly disturbed. Classic resistance maneuver. Literally and figuratively underground, Bend cracked the door, only to duck as a clip of AK fire poured through it. The team hit the dirt and 2D's drones armed as laser sights became visible through the fresh bullet holes in the door. 
A voice from behind the door called. As Ticus. Renda no Muran. Ben shouted back. No nos disperan. Somos amigos del caballo. There was a brief pause and the gun smoke dispersed. The lasers lowered. Americanos. See. The door opened and the team saw a small squad of Hispanic men wearing roughshod combat gear and wielding assault rifles. One man had leonine features, an obvious shapeshifter, some sort of jungle cat displaced from his home. Another was covered in fetishes, a native magician. The man at the front, a soldier with a sibaram and dermal deposits, offered a hand to bend. Any friends of the stallion are friends of ours, as are the Americans who bring us guns and tanks to fight the Aztecs. What is your business here? Geppetto stood and spoke. We're looking for Mariela Rodriguez. The rebel smiled. Come with me. I imagine she'll want to know how four Americans ended up here, too. Mariela Rodriguez was a harsh looking woman. Her hair was cut short, in a man's style. She smoked a Cuban cigar, a minor luxury that clashed with her otherwise stoic appearance. Her ceramic combat armor, and Raz set that doubtless accidentally fell out of a plane Raz is a principled corporation that would never prolong a conflict for arms sales, you see. Was loaded down with additional padding of some sort of tanned hide. She had no less than 4 sidearms on her person, to say nothing of a prodigious amount of knives. The team found Mariella at an impromptu desk deep in the tunnels, next to a radio, marking spots on a map. No, Hernan, don't take that route, it's not safe. They cut off radio to Charlie Sector, we need to send the scouts in first. Pick up a rigger or two, put them on disposal. And dodd check any corpses. Philippe, grab one of the mobile nexuses and pick up the third mechanized as an escort. We need to get you out of the jammer zone to report back to Metropole. For the love of Dios, remember the codes this time, I don't want more reports of friendly fire. The rebel leading the team entered the room. Ahem. Capitan, sir. Capitan, Mom Mariella whirled around to glare at the team. And who are these gringos? Do we invite our spies in now? These are friends of El Gabalo, Mom. Maryless expression brightened to one of cheery hostility as opposed to the normal kind of hostility. Oh, El Caballo sends you? Well let him know that he is a coward and an asshole for running away from this conflict like a bitch with his tail and between his legs. Pinch Azteca Mathurfica. Devish grimaced. Hey. Sensei may be Aztec by blood, but he's got every right to hate them. They made him into a pit fighter against his will. Mariella stared down Dervish. And what are you supposed to be? His advocate? His lawyer? His student, mom. Geppetto stepped in at this point. Look, Captain Rodriguez. We just need to get to the other end of the front. We're independent operatives, and in need of an escort. We can pull our weight in a military setting, in fact, we have more experience in danger than most soldiers. Do you have an in for us or not? Mariella spat on the ground. Sure, we got a troop movement heading that way later tonight. You got this chance to prove yourself, gringo, and I only take you in at all because El Cabrillo vouches for you. Only because of that man. 2D squinted. Lady, what is it with you and Dervish's sensei? You hate him but you trust him? Mariella held up a fist. Around one finger was a gold ring. Of course I trust him. Jose is my dickless coward husband. He's supposed to be here with me on the front lines butchering Aziz but instead he runs off on some hermit kick. Mathurfica. The whole team stared for a moment. What are you looking at, gringos? Geppetto began to back out of the room. Nothing, mom. Well get ready to head out. Wait, said 2D. I got my rigger cocoon shipped out here, and like hell am I walking that whole distance. I am an out of shape channel without a vehicle, a sitting duck. You need to give me a tank, or something. This is so retarded. I feel like an idiot. Stop complaining, 2D, at least you got a vehicle, growled Dervish, as he helped 2D install his rigger cocoon in a beating up forklift. Yep. A vehicle that handles like a shopping cart and will tip over if a 5 year old pushes it. 2D, did you see the look on Captain Rodriguez's face? I was surprised she didn't shoot you in the head. I guess it's just my winning personality. Yeah, that's it. Hold up, I think it's bolted in properly now. Lem get inside 2D climbed into his cocoon. How do I look? 
Like a metal burrito with walrus teeth and wheels. Fuck you. The team donned their night vision and the heaviest combat armor they could wear which didn't amount to much more than bulletproof vests and pads for Geppetto and 2D, but 2D was inside his cocoon. Picked up some explosives for utility, and set out in the morning with a platoon of about 20 troops many of them shifters and a security hacker carrying a small mobile nexus as a backpack. 2D was escorted by every drone he could muster, consisting of the war crime bots, his two dragonflies, and a rotter drone armed with a grenade launcher. They moved swiftly through Zonos and Trico, keeping cloaks and maintained invisibility spells up as long as they could, making for Zona Norte. It was the security hacker who called out first. Drone strike. And Dale. Everyone split for the rubble as two heavily armored steel lynxes rolled down the opposite end of the street. Geppetto, Bend, and Dervish each went to different parts of the surrounding buildings, while 2D turned his forklift into a garage. To his glee, 2D found that the lynxes were networked, and immediately began hacking one of them as an Amazonian rocket crippled the other. Targets neutralized, yelled the hacker as 2D handed control of the other links to his nexus, and the first link sank under a hail of armor piercing bullets, move up. The Aziz know we've come out to play now. The platoon raced through Zona Norte at a run, ducking through alleyways whenever possible. Radar picked up Aztecs moving across the attack site, moving in on the platoon's tail. As the group hit a fire station near the border fence into the jungle, the lieutenant in charge of the operation, a Jaguar shifter, gestured for the team to go through the fence and continue northwest. You got two routes you can take, he yelled, over the sound of lights going off to the south, the west or the east. East takes you closer to Aztec supply lines, they got a mobile bunker out there. West is mostly jungle, bad place to get ambushed. Either way I'll get you to the coordinates you're looking for, but I don't envy you. Stay strong. With that, he armed his underbarrel grenade launcher and began heading for the upstairs. Everyone arm explosives or armor pisses. First wave is gonna be armor, so don't hold anything back. Contact in 2 minutes. Not wanting to be a part of the clusterfuck that was doubtless about to happen, 2D plowed his forklift through the fence and the rest of the team followed. After a quick, terse discussion, the team ultimately decided on taking the jungle route to the west. Sensors of all kinds, including ultrasound, radar, and thermo, were among the team's strong suits. So they figured that it would be smarter to face a hypothetical ambush with a heads up instead of facing the Aztecs on their front lines. As it turned out, it wasn't much of an ambush, as a scouting bend had to dive into the underbrush to avoid the notice of six skimmer hovering mercs in full mill spec. Armed to the teeth and inbound directly for the team. Bend hit his subvocal. Incoming. Everyone grab cover. Dervish booted up all of his own armor's passive systems. Roger that, the first merc over the ridge took a dozen apt shotgun shells, as Dervish set his auto shotgun to rock and roll and emptied the clip. The merc skimmer disc sputted and then gave out entirely, and he bounced and rolled across the ground, trailing loop de loops of blood. He eventually came to rest at the foot of 2D's forklift, looking like a crumpled tin can full of tomato soup that has been jabbed repeatedly with a nail. Hoorah, America, with a wump dervish launched over the hill, extending his blades out of the slots in his armor and launching off the ground in a power armored hulk jump to engage the enemy directly. The merc that dervish was targeting only survived because he held his gun, a light machine gun, above his head as dervish came down. The gun dented, then caved, then fell apart in three pieces as dervish's blade sliced clean through it. The merc, extended two cattle-like blades out of his armor and lunged for dervish, countering dervish's blows with his wrists. There was an immensely loud cablum and a huge muzzle flash, and a tree behind dervish split clean in two, like a weed being pulled. Leaves all over the clearing clouded the air, disturbed either by the falling tree or the shockwave from the massive gunshot. 2D yelled into the comb. Dix. That's an anti-tank gun. Geppetto, you got this one? As 2D's drones rolled past him and opened up on the approaching mercenaries, forcing many of them to drop their skimmers and take cover behind the trees. Geppetto wormed his way through the underbrush towards where the muzzle flash had appeared. Almost. Stand by. 2D. Bend, on the other side of the field of battle, armed the heavy taser at his belt and began climbing a tree, working his way towards the mercs. There was another cablum from the anti-tank rifle as one of the mercs exploded through a tree, a fist-sized hole punched through his chest. 
Bits of bone and rib tore like shrapnel through the surrounding foliage. Geppetto chuckled darkly into the comb. Mine now. Four still alive. With a wank, Dervish slammed his fist blade through the chest plating of the merc he was fighting. The merc recoiled and dropped to the ground, clutching his chest. Ha. Huh. Got you, you fool you are. Ah. Dervish convulsed violently and his visor clouded with blood as he rattled inside his suit from severe nerve damage, dropping to the ground. Geppetto called to 2D and bend. Power bolt. The one at the back's a mage. 2D punched a few buttons in AR. Dervish, if you can hear me, stay down. Everyone else, drop for cover. The Rotodrone deployed off the top of the forklift and quickly ascended to above the battlefield. Cross-referencing footage from the team's various sensors, it quickly targeted the mage. From above the battlefield, there was a thump 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 noise. Everything went to hell as the frag grenades detonated, turning the mage into scrap metal and paste and sending another merc next to him sprawling. Dervish and the merc he had been fighting rolled violently, both caught slightly in the blast. Dervish recovered first, stumbled to his hands and knees, and slammed his elbow blade through the faceplate of the fallen merc with a loud crunch. Bend worked his way to behind the slightly singed anti-tank goon, jammed his taser into the vents in the back of his power armor, and pulled the trigger. Geppetto's puppet convulsed spasmodically as the metal interior conducted the electricity, and then crumpled into a heap at the foot of the tree. As the last merc stood, reeling from the explosion, the murder groans opened fire, putting him down for good in a hail of ballistics that tore up the foliage for meters behind him. The Rotodrone registered an incoming missile mere moments before it exploded out of the sky, its flaming parts dropping onto the battlefield. Shit, move. 2D floored his forklift forward, tilting dangerously as he weaved through the foliage. The rest of the team scrambled to their feet and tried to keep up the pace behind him. Dervish stumbled, slightly the worse for wear. As the Rotodrone crashed into the foliage behind them, the three grenades left in the launcher and the six in its ammo box all cooked off, turning the clearing into a maelstrom of fire and shrapnel. The forklift bounced off the ground as the three other team members all involuntarily flew off their feet, knocked flat by the shockwave. There was a long pause as the crackling of fire began to fill the smoky clearing. 2D asked, experimentally. Anyone alive? Ben stood up a little ahead of him. Yep. I am fine. I think Geppet is tending to dervish right now. What was that? The death of a very, very explosive drone. How are you two doing? That missile might mean the Aziz are on our tail, and I don't want to contend with both two times mercs and a bunch of pissed off Mexicans. Dervish walked towards the forklift with Geppetto in tow, his helmet off and a fresh bandage applied to his head. Doing okay. Had to take a little while to patch ourselves up after the explosion. The bunker should only be another few miles up. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go. Easy for you to say, forklift boy. The team drove for a few more minutes, with Bend once again scouting ahead in his tack suit. Ben set his goggles to record, and then forwarded the footage to 2D to show the rest of the team. Um, guys? This is a problem. Two times Bunker was on top of a cleared hill, with mage man firing ports overlooking each hillside in every direction. Surrounding it was a veritable army of mercs who had set up camp with snipers in four towers around the bunker and four patrolling crimson samurai guard drones armed with tank guns. Jesus titifucking Christ, remarked 2D, in disbelief. It's like a medieval castle. The team set up camp in the jungle to plan. It'll skip over most of the planning, because frankly it took hours to come up with the plan that the team eventually went with. Rather, it'll just skip to the actual execution of said plan and then go from there. The guards sighted a vehicle as it rolled through the fence around the compound. Was it a drone? A tank? It was a forklift with a rigger cocoon. The guards popped off a few shots lazily, but the forklift was a durable machine, even if it was pathetic as it slowly limped towards the bunker. Bored, the security rigger finally directed the Crimson Samurai drones to finish it off as it crept a little too close to the bunker for comfort. The Crimson Samurai didn't fire. The rigger tried again, then checked the signal. Jammed, there was an earth-shattering explosion as the forklift rammed the side of the bunker and then opened on the side facing the bunker. Revealing a man-sized blob of plastic explosive studded with grenades. A large hole caved into the side of the bunker and the merc mages inside toasted, dying instantly. Smart Jimmer held aloft, then directed for the team to follow him, 
and with a pal, Geppetto took out the relevant sniper on the whole side of the compound before dropping into invisibility. Holding 2D like a damsel in distress, Dervish jetted into the open hole, sliding into the bunker, followed by the Steel Lynx drones. Which immediately spun to face the exits and wound up their minigans. The team was inside the bunker, surrounded by hostile mercenaries and vastly outnumbered. The only way to go by this point was down. The team descended to an iron door as the drones began firing at the mercenaries. Bend took the opportunity to grab a fallen keycard. With one swipe, they were in. The first room seemed empty, save for a single hatch in the center that looked like it led down. However, as they edged into the room, Geppetto went on a hunch and ascensed. Above them, in cages presumably triggered by walking fully into the room, were drop bears, vicious magical koalas used as security paracritters. They looked hungry. Okay, here's how it goes, said Geppetto, very lightly. Bend in my cloak and get the hatch. Only then do you dash in, and we all jump down. We good? The rest of the team gulped and nodded. Geppetto and Ben rushed forward and threw open the hatch. Through a rain of murderous, screeching koalas, Dervish and 2D jumped down the hole into the next room, followed almost immediately thereafter by Geppetto and Ben. Geppetto, 2D, and Dervish all landed in a gigantic pile, while Ben flipped the hatch shut. There were loud raking sounds as the drop bears began to work on the steel of the hatch. That won't last for too long, so we're best keep going down, noted Bend. The second room was another featureless tunnel like the first, with yet another hatch. This time, though, it was 2D who stopped the team. Look at where we are. We're in a tiny box of a room. You know what would fuck us now and leave no survivors? A bomb. 2D took Ben's power drill and, operating in hack vision, drilled through a portion of the second hatch to uncover a small red patch of surface. As I suspected. This is amateur hour, really. Spoken as a former terrorist. With careful work over the next few minutes, 2D disarmed the bomb, although the second hatch looked like Swiss cheese by the time he was done with it. The scratching continued from above. No worries, I totally just saved all of us from dying horribly. Let's see what the next level of this ridiculous kill bunker holds. The third room was considerably larger than the first two, with a blast door in back and some kind of large vehicle in the center. It was dark as shit, and had sloped walls almost like. 2D moaned, as floodlights activated on either side of the room, an arena. The large vehicle in the center was a Mitsuha Machinpira, a 3.5 meter tall anthropoid walker drone with four arms, each armed with a chain gun. Two missile banks protruded from its shoulders. This is fucking ridiculous, screamed 2D, as he booked it for the opposite end of the room, deploying his dragonfly drones. The rest of the team was just content to scream other grabbled curses as they split and the drones started firing. 2D was the first to go down, as a bullet swept his leg out from under him. He screeched in pain as it blasted a huge chunk of meat out of his calf, sending him sprawling. He cried out, to his dragonflies. The eyes. Go for the eyes. Its arm swung wildly to grasp him, smashing one of 2D's dragonflies out of the air while the second carved a deep gash through its primary cameras. Blinded, it resorted to sonar, but was distracted by the loud noises already filling the space. It began firing wildly at all the walls, giving the team an opportunity to slide a few amp grenades directly under it. With a fun the chimpira stopped moving, sparking wildly from multiple ports. Dervish jumped off of it, his own armor reacting adversely. 2D stumbled to his feet, producing a medkit from his backpack and doing what little he could to patch his mangled leg together, as Geppetto issued more comprehensive magical healing. I swear, if this next room has ninjas or something I am going to kill myself. The next room had two things, and neither of them were ninjas. They were an adorable Scotty dog, and a tread screen, from which a very satisfied looking man beamed. Two times the hacker was African American, with a youthful face that seemed positively built for the cruel smile he was currently displaying. He had sunglasses and a baseball cap pulled low over his eyes, which obscured his face but did nothing to hide the multitude of wiring protruding from his forehead and the back of his shaved cranium. He worked an AR window in the foreground, chuckling lightly. Welcome, welcome, gentlemen. I have an announcement to make. Devish's shoulders slumped. Bent gawked, despairing. No way. Oh, yes way, Sean Falstaff, Tiggos turned Shatterona. 
That announcement is that you have approximately 30 seconds to live. There was a sudden flow of light into the room as a secondary hatch opened in the ceiling, offering a clear path to the sky. I finally succeeded in compromising the Ra's global network. You were quite the impediment, but I managed it. First I used it to hire a truly prodigious amount of mercenaries and shadowiners, but that was child's play. No, my masterwork will be your deaths. 2D slammed his hands onto the screen. Can the villain speech, it doesn't work for nerds. What the fuck are you talking about? Two times grinned ear to ear, and then the feed cut to a view of the earth from orbit. I have obtained one more satellite, courtesy of the proud Americans at Rasnacro Technology. A Thor shot. The entire team looked up slowly, except for 2D. Someone didn't bank on a technomancer jamming his communications open. What, 2D slammed his hands onto the screen and activated his troads, convulsing wildly as he backhacked two times across the world. For a brief moment he was in a nexus in a forest in Newfoundland, and then. Then he was in space, his icon standing across from a featureless, muscular humanoid flanked by black IC. The enemy icon was working hard at decrypting a barrier surrounding, appropriately enough, the icon of a giant red button. It'll make you suffer for this, echoed two times. It'll make you die, responded 2D, as two fold sprites moved to assist him in an overclocked black hammer, manifesting as something similar to a gigantic haddock. 2D's icon responded in kind, blasting at 2D with a hammer of its own. Both hackers convulsed, one in the bunker and one visible in vid screen, as their icons began to decompile. Manifesting melee weapons a visualization of attack suites, both hackers closed and engaged in a gory battle for their very lives. The ending of the brawl was not a traditional happy one, as with a fell blow, 2D's icon decompiled. And in the real world 2D's biomonitor made a shrill noise as he flatlined and slumped against the wall, bleeding from his tear ducts. Oh no, said Geppetto, advancing on 2D's lifeless body, I am not dying in a goddamn shithole like Bogota, Colombia. He planted his hands flat on 2D's chest, and summoned up the highest force heal spell he could muster. He visibly took injury as magic coursed from his pale hands into 2D, eventually collapsing into unconsciousness with his veins bulging from the drain. In a satellite high above Earth, two times the hacker finally breached the barrier around the Thor shot's controls. Set fire unrestricted. Password Purple Mountains Majesties 1776. Confirmation code QQIGT1SIXA. Secondary confirmation Kyphms 5TN66. Satarjat Batoga. Arm Thor shot. Another icon logged onto the system. Hi there. Before two times could react, he was ganked by a blackout. His icon's movement stopped, briefly stunned. 2D's icon approached the red button, fiddling with details in the space around them. Disarm Thor shot. Satarjat Newfoundland. Warm Thor shot. Fire, in space, 2D could see a huge tungsten rod falling. And, in an instant, two times icon disappeared. Well. That was that, in the real world, 2D fell back from the dread screen, collapsing against the opposite wall. Geppetto spoke first. Is it done, 2D? Are we going to die? 2D rasped. It's over. Gimme that fucking Scotty dog. The dog lapped blood off of 2D's face as he sighed and sank down against the wall. He set his one remaining dragonfly drone to hovering in front of his face, acting as an impromptu camera. Now I'm Scray. Get Mr. Johnson on the line. I got something to do. One month later. In the raw Seattle compound, Mr. McWilliams adjusted the wedding band on his finger. He gulped against the fabric of his American flag tie. It felt like a noose. He sat down at his desk, looking out at the office full of nerds sitting at Nexi in front of him. One of them adjusted his glasses and looked expectantly at McWilliams. You sit, McWilliams coughed twice, and lowered his manicured beard before the building intercom. Attention, everyone. This is Mr. McWilliams. From now on you will know me as Security Director McWilliams. I will control the robots that keep you safe. I will coordinate Ra's good American soldiers in the Seattle Metroplex. First and foremost, I will commit myself to making this compound a better place to live, work, and play. I want all security concerns reported to me directly or, failing that, one of my spiders. 
and so help me god, if one of you tries to sell out the company or get extracted, I will have you jacked into the firewatch training UV node in hot sim dressed as a muslim man with an AK-47. Hep. Sorry. Company policy. Ahem. It'll keep my office door unlocked except during a time of crisis. Feel free to ask me whatever you want. It'll answer as best I can. And, um. It'll try not to troll you, I guess. Unless it's really funny, or you're a dipshit. If you're a dipshit I am firing you. As security director McWilliam sat down, the nerds in his office began to clap. He wasn't sure if they were being sarcastic or not, but he didn't give a fuck. They could suck a dick. Absently, he turned his AR glasses to the news. Newfoundland explosion explained. This message was found posted to an anonymous message board early yesterday morning. No source has been able to verify it, and world governments are decrying it as a fake and a cheap, insensitive cash-in on the tragedy that leveled a large portion of Canada's natural forests. The video, depicting a masked hacker with mystery iconography superimposed over his face and voice modification, is not for the faint of heart. And we implore the viewers to make their own decisions. Ahem shit. Is this thing on? Coughing noises. Hello. Hello to whoever gets this video, I guess. Hi, Anans. Glad to see you around. I am the source of the explosion that destroyed miles of Newfoundland forest 3 minutes ago. I emphasize the timing as a method of verifying my claim, but I suppose that there are those who will cry fake anyway. And I guess that's fine. There will always be dipshits on the internet, just like how there aren't any girls. That's a joke. I am sorry, I am nervous. I recognize that I may now be one of the greatest cyber-terrorists in history. I goosey didn't want to be ignominious about it. No more anonymous. I am not going to pretend that it was just some mystery guy who did it. I think it's, like, customary or something that crazy fuckers who set off bombs give a manifesto. I have a little experience in that, but not enough to prepare me for this one. So, I guess, here goes. I am not going to make it too preachy, bear with me. Ahem. Do you idiots have any idea what really goes on in the shadows? I mean, do you? I don't just mean shadow runners, your multi-million new in action movie franchise headers. I know that you idiots know the parlance. That crime TV show taught you Mr. Johnson, you know what a street samurai is, and how to differentiate a face from an infiltrator. But, I mean, aside from the sanitized guns and tits bullshit you see in the trades, do any of you really get what happens underneath your noses? Comma criminals run the world. Terrorists, mafia, gangs, shadow runners. Some of them sit behind desks in offices and do more damage than all the gangs put together. It's all a gigantic circle jerk of increasingly ludicrous theft and violence. And that's the status fucking quo. I mean, what the fuck? I have made more of a difference being a professional dirtbag than I would in 10 lifetimes of wage slavery. What's up with that? I am monologuing. It's probably the blood loss. I am not a philosopher, or, 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 a psychologist. I am a scared kid who hacked a Thor shot. Because I had to. I am going to be disappearing from the shadows for a while. Naivety is looking pretty damn good right now. Just think. Seriously, think. Think about the world you live in. And what you choose not to see, and what you choose not to do. It could save your life. Shadow run story time eight end. I know it's taken far too long for this part to come out, but I thought it was definitely worth it. Like, you know, I always say this, but I love seeing like, you know, different like, you know, places in the Shadowgun universe. I just think it's great. Like, you know, I love like I, I really enjoyed Africa, so I did I really enjoyed Africa. But like, you know, South America and all just as good. You know what I mean? And also Sensei has a wife, what the fuck? You know what I mean? But no, honestly, you know what bit I fucking loved was definitely uh, 2D and two times fighting. Like, you know, I just, I, I have a bit of a hard time imagining what it would be like for two hackers fighting because I don't really have much of anything, like, you know, references to base it off of. But, like, you know, it's something I definitely want to see more of. I thought it was great the way it was done. But, <laughs> no, the bit that genuinely for me, I, I, I love the hackers fight, but for me, I don't know, I, I was fucking, I, I burst out laughing whenever that African warlord was asking for five AKs, a thousand dollars, and Geppetto's fucking die. Like, okay, I don't blame Geppetto for not wanting to hand it over and all, but, like, you know, come on, for fuck's sake, I thought that was great. It's like, oh, he's very valuable, very valuable, and all that shit. It's like, nah, suck my deck.
but no i thought it was very good but no as always let us know what your favorite bit was down below i know this bit's taking a very long time to come out but like you know hopefully we'll get back on track with halloween and stuff out of the way and also um at the moment i'll i'll probably do a video about this in the not so distant future but youtube appears to have shit itself do you remember about two weeks ago whenever youtube was down for like an hour and a half since then because they're cutting down on google plus and all that and um, pretty much if you don't have the bell notification on you're probably not going to see the videos Um, pretty much everyone is down about 30 40 percent of views since that like everyone that makes youtube videos so like you know that's not ideal but like you know like i'll explain that more in more detail another time but uh definitely click that notification bell if you want to stay up to speed so like uh, as always i hope you guys have enjoyed and i'll see you in the next one if you haven't already check out my Redbubble portfolio, you might just find something you like. This... this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. This... this is so much cancer that I can feel the tumors growing on my back. And it's way down heavy on me, and it's not okay. Can you help a nigga out and just stop this? Please?